Starting a new church is one of the most challenging things a pastor can take on. It's hard enough to lead a growing, healthy, and thriving church. To start, from, start one from scratch is frankly terrifying. And yet, for some reason, uh, I was invited to go to a, a new church start, new uh, this, this gathering, this conference for people who want to start new churches, even though I find the topic terrifying. And, and I figured, well, I'll go learn about it. You never know. And so I went, and I found out the various ways you can start a, a new church. Um, there is the, the most terrifying way is what's called the parachute drop. Here's $300,000. You've got three years. Off you go! Oh my, and then here, you go start a church. My name's Andy. Well, and I don't even know, I mean, it's hard to know what to do next after that. The not quite as terrifying approach is called the mother-daughter, where you go to a church that is healthy and thriving and doing well, and uh, you take like a Sunday school class and spin that off, go about 20 miles down the road, and you start that. You start something with that. So at least you have people that you know and depend upon. That's mildly less uh, scary, but still challenging. And while, while I was at this conference, I, I learned about um, some of the challenges, uh, staff, volunteers, do you, do you get your music right first, or your graphics, or your online presence? Um, can't do it all right away, right? Uh, they're building, you got to worship somewhere, do you borrow, do you rent, do you buy an old church and redo it, do you, do you, I mean, build, what, what do you do? But one of the hardest challenges of starting this, a new church, as I was learning, was uh, playing well with other churches. Because unfortunately, it, it is not the case that when there's a new church that every other church in town goes, yay! Not everyone gets excited that there's a new church and doesn't see this as a, a something to celebrate that more people are being reached for Jesus Christ. Some people unfortunately see it as competition, a problem, a challenge. And so learning about starting a new church, you learn like it takes this amazing combination of a visionary who is organized, a dreamer who can do paperwork, uh, but in finding that that ends up being the most limiting factor of starting new churches. The Missouri Conference of the Methodist Church has committed to, to build, uh, to plant and build 30 new churches in a decade. And I think we're going to fail into the mid-20s, which is still pretty good. Uh, and the, but the limiting factor is not the money. You can find 300 grand. It, it's not easy. You don't exactly fi find it lying around. But you can find 300 grand. What, what's hard to find is the person who can do it, to find the pastors who can do this. It's a challenging thing to plant a church and find the people who can do it. That, that's, that's hard. And yet it could be harder. Because if you go back to the first church planner... It was even harder for him. And, and that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at Paul. And, and he faced all these challenges that I just named, plus some more. He, he, he's, uh, Paul, you could argue Jesus is the first church planner. Yes, he's 12 disciples, the beginning of the church. And there were probably other people who started a church or two before Paul started getting going. But, for, but to really talk about the first person who started churches as a way of life, it's Paul. He, he's the one who is really the first church planter. We read about his journeys through the book of Acts, and it's the journey of someone going from place to place, spending a year or two years at a place, starting a church, and then, then moving on. And so what we read of in, in uh, Acts today, in Acts 17, we read of his, uh, what happens at, as he was starting a church in a place called Thessalonica. You say it a few times, it'll roll off your tongue, promise. Uh, but he goes to Thessalonica, and he doesn't, he doesn't do the parachute drop where he just starts knocking on doors and saying, hey, hey, my name's Paul, let me tell you about Jesus. The people tend to respond to that by closing the door, right? But uh, he goes to the place where he knows there are people who know something about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He goes to the synagogue. And he spends three Sabbaths there talking about Jesus, that this is the one who, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Exodus, the God of Israel, he has sent the Messiah, his name is Jesus, let me tell you about him. And he gathers some folks together and he starts this, this church. And it's going well, he's there for months, three months, six months, nine months. He's there for a bit. He, he's not there as long as he usually is at other uh, church starts he does, but he is there for a few months until he runs into a problem. And this is what modern church planners don't usually run into. While 
the, uh, he doesn't have other churches that get angry at him. What he has is other synagogues. And so some Jewish folks get angry at, at him that they're there and they're turning the world upside down, which is a little bit of hyperbole. But he, they're, they're messing with everything. And now uh, he has to flee for his life. When we get angry at another church, we talk smack about them, even though we shouldn't. Uh, when Paul had someone get angry at him, they ran him out of town, and he had to flee for his life, and he went to the next town over, Baroa, and they were so angry about him, they actually followed him over to give him trouble over there. And he had to flee for his life again from a second town. So that's the type of challenge he, he is facing. And, but he, he goes on, and uh, he then goes to Athens and Corinth, and Corinth works out pretty well, and so he starts a church there. And, and so Paul continues on. Sometimes things go well, sometimes they're more of a challenge. But he never forgets about Thess the, the church at Thessalonica, the church that he started, and never really got to really get it firmly started and founded. He had to leave early. And so him and, and his two uh, fellow church planters, Silas and Timothy, they have this wild and crazy, to us this is like normal of course, but to them, the wild and crazy idea, it's the first time we, we know of it happening, they're going to send a letter to the entire church. And so they send this letter to the entire church, and, and it happens about 49 or 50 AD, and, and to send this letter back so that it could be read to the church. About 10% of the population was literate, so it's, you just found someone who could read, and they would read it to everyone, everyone else. And so they send this letter back, this letter to be read to the church, and, and these words, this letter, these are the first words of the New Testament. Not chronologically speaking. The first words chronologically are the beginning of the Gospels, obviously. But the first words that, are at, that were actually written down, the first words to a pen made paper, this is them. Because this was written in either 49 or 50 AD. The rest of the, this is the first of all of Paul's letters. The Gospels won't be written for another decade, decade and a half, is the, for the first of those. So this is it. This is the beginning of the New Testament. And this is what Paul writes, right? Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. That's it. That's the first words. And if you want to memorize, if you want to get started on memorizing the Bible, this is the best verse to start with. Because this verse shows up 12 other times. This is, when every time Paul writes a letter, this is how he starts. Paul, to this church, grace to you and peace. Every time, that's how he starts it. He, he gets this nailed down, and this is how he wants to always start talking to people. And so we're going to look at this, this letter to, over the next uh, time, but we're going to start with just this one verse today. This letter starts by talking about Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, the three of them. If you ask people who is it that was, who starts the church, it's usually Paul. But Paul never did it alone. And, and I think that we, there's a sense we always want the hero, there's always the person who does it, who always, like, who wins the football game? It's the quarterback. No, it's not. You know what a quarterback is without a defensive line or offensive line? Flat. Offensive line. Sorry, I shouldn't have said defensive line. But yeah, quarterback without a line is flat. I mean, who, who makes a school run really well? Is it, does the superintendent get all the praise? Probably get all the problems, don't you? Uh, <laughs> and superintendent is important, but it's, he's not the only, or she is not the only person. It's, it's the teachers. We know who really runs the school. It's the secretaries. And uh, it... It is who makes a movie. Is it the director? No, actually the guy who makes the movie is the person holding the camera. And, and so we, we often focus on one person and say, they're the one who did it. No, they're not. It's always done with a team of other people. That's what we see here. Paul did not start the church. Paul worked with Silvanus and Timothy to start the church. They worked together as a team. Following Jesus is always a team sport. You never follow Jesus alone. And, and as we have learned here at this church, if you want to do something, you've got to convince someone else it's a good idea. And how many other people do you need to convince? Two. If you can get three people excited about something, you can do anything. If you can't convince two other people that they get excited about it, well, well good luck, right? That's how life works. That's how following Jesus works. It's a team sport. And so that's the first part of it. The second part of this introduction, to whom this is written? It is written to the church of the Thessalonians. And so whose church is it? Non-rhetorical question. Whose church is it? 
The Thessalonians, right? Now, I told you this verse shows up 12 other times at the beginning of all the letters. This is the first time he shows up. And this is the only time he puts it like this. I'm not saying Paul was wrong because it gets dicey to start saying that the Bible is wrong and we're not going to talk about that today. What I am going to say is that Paul might have rethought how he put this because he writes here the church of the Thessalonians and then when he writes the next letter he writes to the, ch to the church of God at Corinth. To the church of God in Galatia. To all of the gathered Christians in Rome. I mean, so he never, he never used, says it quite like this again. And, and I think there's a reason behind that. If it's the church of the Thessalonians, who gets to call the shots? The Thessalonians. And how often do we hit the same thing? Whose church is this? Whose church is, we're standing in right now? Whose church is this? Is this my church? Is it your church? It's God's church, right? Because if it's my church, then we should do what I want. And if it's your church, we should do what you want. Well, tough cookies. It's not mine, it's not yours, it's God's. So, this kind of gloss over that little part of the introduction. Paul gets it right the next time. So, Paul continues, talks about God the Father and the Lord Jesus. This is not full Trinitarian theology as will show up later in time, but it's the very beginnings of putting God the Father and Jesus Christ next to, next to each other and saying, yeah, yeah, they're, the same. they're, they're connected, they're, they're equal. We'll, we'll figure more of that out later. And then he hits the final few words, and these are the words that have the real meat to them. Grace to you and peace. These are amazing words. I am really impressed with, the more I looked at these words, the more impressive they became. Because he starts out with grace. And grace is a Greek word. Grace is a Greek word that talks about, if I wish you grace, what I'm saying is I find you beautiful, and I want you to become more beautiful. All right. And so grace to you is coming grace. We, we talk about grace coming from, from God, a free gift from God. Grace to you is saying that God finds you beautiful and wants you to become more beautiful. He's going to offer you freedom and acceptance and forgiveness so that you might become more beautiful. And so to say grace to you is to say, I hope you receive all of the best gifts God offers. That's the Greek concept of grace to you. Grace and then peace. Peace is a Jewish word. Peace is this Jewish word. It's, it, 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 shalom is what you may have heard before. And the problem with say, translating shalom as peace is that it completely whiffs on the deepness of what this is getting at. When I say I'm at peace with someone, that means I'm not slugging them. I'm not actively fighting them, right? That's not what the Jews are talking about when they say peace. When they say peace, they don't mean the absence of violence. They mean fullness of life. When I wish for you shalom, what that means is I hope that you get to have a great lunch with people you love and you are at peace with and who love you back. And then you have a job tomorrow that matters. You have work that is important. When I say shalom to you, I, it is not your job, it's your community, it's your family. It is a fullness of life. It is everything you could desire in life. That's what I'm wishing for you. That you understand who your God is and that you are saved and forgiven. And so what Paul is doing here is taking this amazing Greek concept. Grace to you. You are beautiful and God wants to make you even more beautiful. And peace. That you should have fullness of life. And he's putting them side by side. And he is using this to address it's something he's going to address again and again and again. In Romans, Paul talks about God came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. In Galatians, Paul will say that in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Paul will say, 2 Corinthians 5, that we are given a ministry of reconciliation. And who do we need to reconcile? Jew and Greek. In the same way that the foundational sort of split divide sin in America that we have been grappling with for centuries and we're still grappling with today. What is it? It's the black-white split, right? We have been dealing with racism in America for centuries and we're not done yet. We're still struggling with it. 
If you take that, you rewind 2,000 years, and first century, it was not black and white, it was Jew and Gentile. It was the same sort of strife. It always was coming up, and you always kept on thinking, why can't this get solved? Why does it keep on being a problem? This is what Paul was talking about. From the, throughout his ministry, to all the churches who are always struggling with this Jew and Gentile divide, the very first words he writes to one of the first churches he is founding Grace and peace. Greek and Gentile brought together, the finest of both. Don't try to downplay it. Don't try to pretend it doesn't exist. Don't try to find a third word that's neutral. Greek and, and, and Jewish. Gentile and Jew brought together. It, it, it's right here in this, these first words. And, and the, the order of the words matters too. Most Bible translations translate it as grace and peace to you. And that kind of, well, whiffs. Because it's not grace and peace to you. It's grace to you and peace. It is what the logic of that. Once you receive everything God has to offer you, once you receive forgiveness, acceptance, purpose, mission, drive, discipleship, once you accept all of that, grace to you, then peace. It's not grace and peace to you. It is grace to you. Receive everything God wants to offer you, and then you will have the fullness of life that you desire so deeply. I have to give credit where credit is due. This entire sermon is brought to you by a good Baptist friend of mine, Brian Baker. I have always struggled reading Paul. I, I don't like reading Paul. I am bad at reading Paul. Give me a good gospel. Give me the Old Testament. Give me Deuteronomy, for God's sake. Paul, I find challenging. And I talked to my friend Brian Baker. And I, I was looking at this chap, the First Thessalonians. I said, Brian, I could preach two sermons on this. And he said, Andy, I could preach for three months. And so we sat down to compare notes. And you know what? There is three months worth of preaching on First Thessalonians. I'm not going to do it to you. I promise. <laughs> so we'll do like a couple weeks. We won't do it. But my friend Brian, he pointed at this first verse and he said, there is real meat here. Just those words, grace to you and peace. You could preach on that forever. That is just, is there anything finer that you could offer someone? Is there anything better you could wish to someone? Grace to you. May you receive everything God wants for you and may that fill up your life. Grace to you and peace. That one, we'll cover the rest of the book faster, I promise. But just that one verse, it's amazing. I, you, you may have noticed I always sign letters, peace, or emails, peace, and then put my, my initials. This is what I'm going to say from now on. Grace to you in peace. Everything that Paul talks about next is rooted in this. A final note about grace and peace. Remember how rough that community was treating them? Like, could you imagine living in a town that runs your pastor out? I mean, I'm not talking about churches running their pastor out, which does happen. I'm talking about, can you imagine living somewhere where the town runs your pastor out? That is not a place where everything is going hunky-dory. That's not like everything is a wonderful place to live. That's a challenge. And yet, even to this situation, Paul writes to you, you're having a rough go, and I know how rough it is because they ran me out. To you, grace and peace. The grace and peace we receive is not due to how great our life is going around us. It is due to how much we receive what God has to offer. We're going to take a look at this letter. It's a short letter. I invite you to take a read of it this week. It won't take very long. Just take a couple minutes. And we'll take a look at the way that Paul deals with some of the challenges this church is facing. But this is how I want us to start. The same way that Paul wishes to his church the finest he can offer, grace to you and peace. That's what I want to wish to you to this day as well. Grace to you. May each of you receive the finest that God wants to offer you. May you each receive forgiveness and acceptance and love and community. May you all receive that and may it bring you fullness of life. May it bring you peace. May it bring you joy. May it bring you everything you need so that you can look towards the next day and say, thank you, God. This was a good day and tomorrow will be a good day too. Amen.